you know, while Jordan's still playing, I want, I want to do something real quick. God spoke to me while I was in the back going over my notes. Don't y'all just love when, does anybody else just love when God starts speaking to you? Like, it's not in my notes. It's not something I planned. But I was sitting back there, and God reminded me of something. And in Psalm 97, it says this. The Lord reigns. Let the earth rejoice. Let the many coastlands be glad. Clouds and thick darkness are all around him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Fire goes before him and burns up his adversaries all around. His lightning lights up the world. The earth sees and trembles. Mountains melt like wax before the Lord, before the Lord of the earth. And it goes on to say, the heavens proclaim his righteousness and all the people see his glory. All worship, all worshipers of images are put to shame who make their boasts in worthless idols. The Lord gave me that tonight and told me to remind you that he reigns. Somebody should get excited about that. God reigns. God reigns. It doesn't matter what anything looks like right now, politically, financially, economically, God still reigns. And I think we need to give God a great big hand for that. Let's, let's just praise him for just a minute. God, we thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jordan, thank you guys so much, man. Thank you all. Y'all are so awesome. Somebody tell them how great of a job they did tonight. What? I, listen, I've been in a lot of churches over the years, and I'm going to tell you, we got one of the most awesome worship teams. We, I mean, we really do. I mean, like one person got excited about that. We got an awesome worship team. We are blessed. Listen, for a church that came from doing CD music to having such an amazing worship team, come on now. Come on now. Praise God. So I'm excited to be in here tonight. If you can't tell, I get a little excited when I get to speak the word. Um, and it, it feels like being a grown-up, being on the big stage. So, you know, it's, it's really awesome being here with you guys. Uh, don't, I'm not going to lie. Adults kind of intimidate me a little bit, so I'm going to pretend they don't. Um, so, yeah, like my teens are hiding way over there. Y'all see that? Praise God. So let me pray real quick before I get started. Father, God, you're just so awesome. We thank you that you reign in every situation, every circumstance. You reign through every storm, God. You reign no matter what the climate looks like, God, no matter what storm is heading our way, God, that you reign supreme and above all. And Father, tonight, as we hear your word, God, as, as you've given me a word tonight, Lord, I ask that you would let every word that I would say fall harmlessly to the ground. But Holy Spirit, every word you would have spoken would pierce to the depths of who we are, that we would be changed by your word, because it's your word that molds us and shapes us in Jesus' mighty and matchless name. Amen. Amen. So I'm going to say something really quickly before we put up the first scripture. How many of you get excited when you get punched in the face? Anybody ever been punched in the face? Like you take a, 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 like a good solid punch to the eye and you're like, yes, do it again. Anybody? Anybody at all? No? All right, so how about when you wake up on Monday morning, you check your bank account because you had something planned and you're like negative 30 bucks. Anybody get excited? Anybody else is like, yes, hallelujah, I'm broke. No? Okay, all right. Uh, how about when you go to work and your coworker just irritates you like to no end? Anybody else like, or are you young people, you go to school and y'all got that one person at school that you just want to throw a punch every time you see them? You get excited when they irritate you? Anybody? Anybody? I, okay, all right. So maybe the disciples were a little weird because we see in James chapter one, verse two, James says this, he says, count it what? All joy. So when I greet people, no matter what time of day it is, I always say good morning. Like, I'm like, good morning, right? And, and people ask me all the time, why do you say good morning? It's not morning, it's evening. Well, the Bible says that joy comes in the morning, right? So, so he says here, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. Other versions say all diverse trials. So what trials was he talking about? There's a word there. He was talking about all types of trials. How many of y'all ever go through trials? Anybody? Anybody? Yeah, like, you're like 2020, Pastor Matt, 2020. That's all I got to say. That's, you know, when somebody's going through a bad time in the future, we're going to refer to that as having a 2020. Yeah. What's going on in your life? I'm having a 2020. It could be like 2026, and they're going to be like, I'm having a 2020. You know, because 
A lot of people this year has been one of the most challenging, one of the most difficult, one of the most stressful, one of the most anxious, one of the hardest years that you've faced. Matter of fact, I've heard it said, I, I, every now and then I'll turn on the TV and watch a little preaching, not too often. Um, but I, I've seen it like so many people are like, oh, this is the worst year for the church. I would contest that. I would say this has been the greatest opportunity for the church since the first century. The greatest opportunity, in my opinion, we've had the greatest opportunity. Why? Because we've gone through some garbage this year. The church has faced some persecution in America. I'm not, not, not real persecution, but we've faced some stuff this year compared to years past, you know? And, and he says this, he says, count it all joy when you face various trials. Now, in my opinion, I think James might have been hit in the head one too many times. Maybe he was high when he wrote this. I don't know. But maybe he was just out of his mind. He said, count it all joy. I think he had been beaten up one too many times. Because he's like, yeah, it's, it's fun. Let's do it again. And then you have to look at, at other places in the Bible, though. We were reading uh, two weeks ago at Adult Bible Studies. Shameless plug here. If you're not coming to Adult Bible Study, I encourage you, get there. It has been amazing. We're in, in, in the book of Acts, and if you really want to know about the, the, the church and how the church, go read in the book of Acts with us. I mean, we, and, and the dialogue and everything has been great. But we're reading in Acts chapter 5, uh, the week before last, and we see that two of the apostles are, are arrested. And they're told, don't preach in the name of Jesus anymore. And, and they, they tell them, you can't do this anymore. If you do it, then we'll kill you or whatever. You know, they, they started like really giving the apostles a hard time. Now, we haven't really been told in America we can't preach in the name of Jesus. And I wonder how many would actually stop if they were told they could no longer preach in the name of Jesus. I think we would get some really dramatic shifts in churches. We'd find out who really has the mindset of the disciples. And we see over in Acts chapter 5, uh, verse 40 and 41, it says, and they called in the apostles who, they, they, we're talking about the council here, the, the, the Jewish council calls them in. It says, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Then they left the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer. Again, with the whole rejoicing thing. Again, with the counting of joy. You just got whooped, man. Now, I don't know how many kids get a spanking and are like, yes, I want more. Right? Did anybody have a kid that did that? Not me, because my kids were like, oh, no, uh -uh, I don't want to whooping again. But the disciples, man, when they got whooped, these apostles, they get beaten Cat of nine today. They, they, I mean, they get beaten. I mean, it's not like somebody like patted them on the back. I mean, they got a good solid whooping, and they got excited. It says they left the council rejoicing. They were like, "Yes, what do we need to do to get this happening again?" They were praising God that they were able to get. I don't know if anybody's getting this, Pastor Dina. They were excited that they got to get beaten. Who does that? Right. 2020, we're upset if the carpet ain't right in church. Did I say that out loud? I did, sorry. Uh, no, I'm not sorry at all. Actually, we do. We get offended over the smallest things. We, we, we stop fellowship over the smallest things. And these guys are getting beaten for the gospel's sake. Okay, so let's go on a little bit further to see really the mindset of the disciples. The mindset of the disciples, I think there was something in the Kool-Aid. Because they all started getting excited about getting whooped and beaten. Now, how many of y'all, if God, when, when, when the altar call was given and you gave your life to Christ, if the pastor stood on the stage and said, all right, before you come to the altar, let me tell you what's going to happen to you. In the years that you're going to follow Christ, people are going to make fun of you. They're going to ridicule you. You might get beaten. In some countries, you're going to get beheaded. So if you want all that, come on and go follow Jesus. Most of us would have stayed in our seats. Most of us would have been like, ah, oh, no, I'm good, thanks. I'll, uh, I'll take the next boat out, right? Because, I mean, when you think about it, I mean, if, if you go to a restaurant, how many of y'all like to go out to eat? I, I love to eat, and I promised myself I wasn't going to talk about food because I'm hungry. But when you go out to eat, has you ever had somebody invite you to dinner and been like, 
hey, let's go to that restaurant over here. It's garbage. Think about that for a minute. Hey, have you ever had somebody invite you to a bad restaurant? They're like, hey, listen, you're going to go over there, but the food's going to be horrible. Right? Well, it's kind of that way when we go to Christ, really. If somebody had said, come to Jesus, but life's going to suck sometimes, you would have been like, well, what do you mean? Well, sometimes life's going to be hard. But guess what? When you don't come to Jesus, life's going to suck sometimes. So we see over in Acts chapter 9, one of my favorite stories is the conversion of Paul. I love Paul because Paul goes from a super religious guy to a Jesus freak. I mean, like, he just goes so deep into who he is in Christ that people are like, that dude's crazy. Let's follow him, right? So we see there's this believer, in, and now back the story up here. Everybody knows the story. Saul's on his way to Damascus. Jesus shows up. He goes blind for three days, ends up over at the house on Straight Street. And we know that part of the story. Well, there's a verse in there, that, and, and I don't have it in my notes, but there's a verse in there It says, and there was a certain believer named Ananias. And God spoke to Ananias and said, Ananias, you got to go over here and talk to Saul of Tarsus. And everybody knew the name Saul of Tarsus. It was like somebody saying, hey, Jack the Ripper's coming to church Sunday. Okay? It was that kind of same, oh my gosh, really not Saul of Tarsus kind of mentality, right? So, so he's like, you got to go over there. you got to speak to him because, and this is where we pick up on the story. In Acts chapter 9, verse 15, he says, but the Lord said to him, go, for he is my chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer <laughs> for my uh, name. Now, that doesn't sound so bad when you first read it. Right? But then when you go over and actually read in 2 Corinthians, and I'm getting to the core of where I'm, I'm not even warmed up yet, so y'all just bear with me. We, we get to the, the, the crazy part. Here's the crazy part. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Starting in verse 24, it says, Five times I received at the hands of the Jews 40 lashes less one. Now, the Jews were his own people. They knew him. They knew who he was. He was a, uh, a staunch uh, Pharisee, and, and he was a teacher and he knew they knew who he was so now all of a sudden they don't like him no more so you don't always win friends when you come to jesus it says three times i was beaten with rods once i was stoned now in 2020 you got to make sure you verify that not in a good way he was stoned to death they tried to rock him to sleep okay three times i was shipwrecked a night and a day i was adrift at sea is anybody seeing a pattern here? And on frequent journeys, I was in danger from the rivers, danger from the robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger in the sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and in hardship, through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food and cold exposure, and apart... <laughs> From other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. Sign me up, coach! Okay, now let me mind you, in chapter 9 of Acts, he says, God told Ananias, he says, I'm going to show him everything he's got to suffer for my sake. Paul knew that all of this was going to happen to him. We get upset and we tub our, stub our toe on the way out the door to church, man. We say things, Right? Oh my gosh, I'm suffering this morning for Jesus' sake. I'm going to church anyhow. Because of my... I mean, I know that's a little extreme, but that's kind of the mentality we have in the, the Western church today is, is uh, well, I'm a little sore this morning, so I think I'm going to stay home and sleep in. I was up a little late last night, so uh, yeah, pastor won't miss me. No, pastor won't miss you. Okay, pastor will miss you. That sounded a little cold. Pastor's going to miss you, but what you're going to miss is what pastor has for you given to you from him from God, okay? So we back off of things for the smallest reason. We back off of church. We back off. Listen, you show up for Sunday morning. Listen, I, if pastor showed up on Sunday morning and we were standing here with uh, rods and sticks ready to beat him, do you think he'd come back next Sunday? Absolutely. 
Do you think most Christians would show back up to a place that they were beaten or a place where they were stoned almost to death? No. Paul, you know what Paul did when they, they, they drug him outside the city in Greece and they, they hit him with all the rocks and tried to kill him? It says that he got back up and walked back into town. And we complain about the storm. Now, that's what I want to talk about tonight is storms. How many of y'all have faced storms in your life? I had a mentor one time. I love this mentor. He was awesome. He always had the most encouraging things to say. He looked at me one time. He says, as a pastor, he goes, nope, as a Christian, Matthew, you are either going into a battle or you're coming out of a battle. And I'm like, oh, well, that sounds like too much fun. Let's do it, right? You know, it's crazy to think that that we go from battle to battle or we go from storm to storm. You know, we're in a record year for storms hitting land, right? In a record, record year, record year. It seems fitting for 2020, doesn't it? And there's another one off the coast of Florida right now. Guess what? I say, bring it on. You know, because when you learn what storms do and how they affect you and how they affect those around you and what God uses them to culminate in your life, it makes a big difference. So I want to, I have to address a, a teaching really quickly that's popular in America right now before I can go into the rest of what God gave me for you tonight. How many of you have heard this teaching? God will never give me more than I can handle. Right? I mean, you turn on the most popular preachers, you're going to hear something similar. Don't worry, Pastor Candace, God will never give you more than you can handle. Really? Really? Are you sure about that? Because, see, we have a comfortable Christianity. We want to be comfortable. We want, because there's, there's a, that, that teaching has been around for years. When you come to Jesus, everything will be good. At least that's what I heard when I was younger. And then when I came to Jesus, I'm like, they lied! Right? Anybody else, yeah, like, anybody else ever hear that? And you're like, wait, this isn't what the preacher said? I don't remember him talking about turmoil. I don't remember him talking about still being broke. I don't remember him talking about still being hungry. This is the apostle Paul that wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. Do you think that was more than he could handle? That was by, by show of hands, how many of y'all think that he could handle that on his own? No. He couldn't. He couldn't handle that on his own. That's why we have the Holy Spirit. That's why we have God moving in our life. Because here's the thing, if God, if you could handle everything, you would need God. So let's say about it. So let's, let's, in reality, do we really think God would never give us more than you can handle? Let me tell you, God will absolutely give you more than you can handle. He'll let you have it all until you learn to lean on him. Because see, when you learn to lean on him, more than you can handle is okay because he can handle it. More than you can handle is okay because he's going to pick it up and be like, you know what? You don't have to carry this. Why? Because the battle belongs to the Lord, right? He's, I'm gonna say, we just say, I'm gonna see a victory. Why are we going to see a victory? Because we're strong, because we're mighty, because we're worried. No, because we're weak. And we can't handle it. And in our weakness, God has shown strong. Because, see, he gets the glory, and it's a fixed system. It's, it's rigged, I'm sure of it. That no matter what, he seems to get the glory out of it. Go figure. I, I just don't understand. Like, no matter how hard I try, I can't get any of the glory. He gets it all. You know, I remember laying in, my, in, in a hospital bed in 2016, thinking, God, is this the end? And fortunately, it was just the beginning, because God showed me some things. Because a lot of us do this. We try to handle everything on our own. We try to carry it on our own. And then when the storm comes up, we're like, oh my gosh. What do I do now? When we wake up and we, we find out that things aren't the way we hoped they would be this morning, you know, when you wake up and have a Monday, or you wake up and have a 2020, right? Has anybody noticed that this year's been like 10 years long? But it's like such an exciting time. Listen, I don't remember a time in my Christian walk over 20 years I've been as excited about a year as I have this year. I know I sound crazy. No, I sound like James. Count it all. Count it all joy. When you get that mindset of counting it joy and things go awry, you can sit back and go, all right, God, I want to see you do this. You can sit back and be like, all right, Daddy, 
I'm taking my hands because see, the problem is we try so hard to lift and, and, and to carry the stress, the burdens, the, the, the worries, the, listen, I have teenagers, I know about stress. And we try to make sure that we're carrying all of that burden. Most of you didn't realize what it was going to be like until you had one. And you're like, oh my gosh, they didn't tell me about teenagers. Well, they did. You just were a teenager, so you weren't listening. But the thing is, is we try to carry it. And God's going, no, 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 no. You don't have to. You don't have to carry this all on your own. Because see, when you have more than you can handle and you learn to cast those cares, when you learn to, my, my wife used to get so aggravated at me, like the first probably six years of our marriage, she would get so frustrated with me. She'd be a ball of stress, man. She'd be like, I don't know how we're going to do it. I don't know. Why. And I'm like, what are you worried about? She's like, why aren't you stressing? I'm like, because you're stressing enough for the both of us. I don't have to stress. Do you know why I don't have to stress? Because my job is not my income. My job is not my provider. It might be my income, but it's not my provider. If I lose my job tomorrow, guess what? God's going to provide for me. If, if somebody didn't get that, somebody's, somebody's so stressed about their job that they're like, oh, what if I lose my job? Guess what? You serve a God who is bigger than your job. He's bigger than the mountain in front of you. He's bigger than the Goliath that you're looking at. He's bigger than the thing that's got you all knotted up in here. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Somebody's like, I got ulcers. It's because you're worrying all the time. Stop worrying. It's amazing what happens when you de-stress your life. You know, Pastor was talking about decluttering. He was talking about, uh, you know, simplifying on Sunday, right? Well, it's the same concept. When you de-stress your life, how much healthier you can be. <laughs> I'm not saying don't care, but what I'm saying is don't care. Y'all know what I mean? Okay, Y'all get that? Don't, it's, it's not like you're just walking around flipping about everything. There's things that you're, you can be serious about, but not so much to the point where you're like, oh my gosh, you know, your fingernails are gone because you're like, you know, some of us are just because we got bad habits, but you know, like you worry, you stress, you're stressed, like you wake up in the middle of the night sweating. Why? Because you're worried. You're stressed out. Why? Because there might be a storm coming your way. Well, let me ease your stress. It's not there might be. There is a storm coming your way. And I'm not talking about Etta or whatever they're calling it. I'm talking about a storm in life. There is a storm. Young people, listen. There is a storm coming your way. It might be in high school. It might be in college. There's a storm. coming. It might be tomorrow. You might wake up and be like, whoa. And I'm not talking about the weather. I'm talking about those hard moments in life where you're just like, what do I do next? You trust God. You trust God. Why? Because it's his victory. It's his battle. He has bigger shoulders than you have. He's got a bigger count than all of us. I'm excited about that one. Right? So, and that's just food for thought. If God never gave you more than you could handle, how would you grow? If God never gave you more than you could handle, how would you learn to trust him? How would you learn to lean on him? How would you learn to be like, so the problem is most of us, he lets us more, have more than we can handle, and we buckle under it, and we end up with a, a need in mental health days because we're freaking out, right? But that's not too unlike the disciples. The disciples did the same thing. See, Pastor talked about storms on Sunday. He talked about um, three types of storms, what storms do. They, the perfecting storms, protecting storms, and correcting storms. Sometimes I feel like I'm in all three at one time. Anybody else? You're like, God, you're chipping away at me, but you're correcting me, but you're, you're perfecting me. It's like, whoa. Anybody, like... Y'all see the twister up there? Anybody else ever feel like that? Like you're just in the middle of a twister. You're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah, right? Anybody? Okay. Can y'all tell I'm a youth pastor? I like to have fun with this. So there's a story. There's two stories that I absolutely love about storms in the New Testament. And Jesus is involved in both of them. The first one is we find in Mark chapter 4. Starting in verse 35. It says, on that day when evening had come, he said to them, let's go across the other side. He's talking to his disciples. And leaving the crowd, they took with him in a boat just as he was. And other boats were with him. If you've got your Bible or your Bible app, I want you to highlight, underline, and circle. And other boats were with him. We're going to come back to that in a minute. It says, and a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat so that the boat was already filling. 
But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And when he awoke, he rebuked the wind, said to the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who, is, who then is this that even the winds and the sea obey him? Whoa. That's not, can, that would be like the greatest movie. Like, I mean, like if they, with the special effects today, can y'all imagine that as a movie? Like winds are breaking all over and the disciples are like, what's going on? Anybody on TikTok? Does anybody watch TikTok? It, okay, so teens, y'all, y'all will get this. There's that TikTok where it's always, doesn't he see us? Don't you see me? I, yeah, I see you, right? So the disciples are standing there like, D -d -d does he not see what's going on? Does he not that we're dying, Jesus? Now, let me point out a couple things here. One, Jesus was in the storm with them. Jesus was in the boat. They've seen Jesus raise the dead. They've seen Jesus do all these miraculous things, and they're freaking out. Don't he care? Don't he? Do, do, I, how many of us ever think you feel like that? Jesus is asleep at the will. It's not Jesus, take the will. It's Jesus, wake up. You've got the will, man, right? It's, it's like... Why are you asleep at the wheel, Jesus? Why are you sleeping through my storm? Why are you? And he's, he's, what's his response? You still have no faith? After all the things you've seen, and all the things you've walked through, and all the things I've challenged you with, and all the times I've come through for you, is it still not enough for you to have faith enough to believe me in the storm? Now, I told you to circle, highlight, underline, score, exclamation mark, one line there. It says, and there were other boats with them. I'm going to surprise you with something. I'm hoping to shock some, some uh, like, minds here. Your storm is not always for you. Somebody said hallelujah. hallelujah. Your storm's not always for you. It's not just for you. Because there's always something you're going to get out of your storm, right? But it's not always just for you. For you. Why? Because we are surrounded by people who are watching us walk this way. Oh, you believe you're a Christian? You say you're a Christian? Anybody ever heard that besides me? My family used to, like, I hope none of them are watching because I know I'll catch flack for this at Thanksgiving, but they used to call me preacher boy when I first started preaching because, and they were always, it seemed like, I don't know if they actually were, but it seemed like they were always waiting for me to mess up. They were waiting for me to drop a bad word. They were waiting for me to uh, get in a bad mood. They were waiting, oh, I thought you were a preacher. I am. I absolutely am. I am anointed. I am called. I am, God set me on fire 20 years ago to preach his word, but guess what? I'm also human, and I'm gonna fail. Guess what? I'm going I'm to help you out here, relieve a little stress again. You're going to fail. Pastor says this all the time. If, you don't listen, if you've never heard this, I challenge you to listen to him closely because he says, welcome to the failure club. We all land there from time to time, right? But see, when we go through a storm, there's other people looking. Oh, Miss Claudia, how are you going to handle that person? I mean, they were, they were so rude to you. Are you going to respond and are you going to punch them in the eye? Can you all imagine Miss Claudia throwing this with somebody? <laughs> She's so sweet. I, anyhow, sorry. Uh, but it, there were other boats around them. So what happened when Jesus caught the storm? Think about that for a minute. There's other boats. They, they leave out. There's boats on the horizon. They're all around. It didn't say how many boats, but there were boats. There were boats, right? There were other people in other boats that had nothing to do with the disciples in, in the inner circle. But when Jesus said, Peace be still. All of a sudden, everybody in, that was surrounding them, their storm calmed too. Sometimes your response to your storm will calm a storm in somebody else's life. I'm glad four people got that. Praise God. Because guess what? Somebody's going to go through a storm really soon. And I'm not prophesying doom. I'm telling you, you're going to go through a storm, and you, the way you respond to your storm is going to affect how somebody else's face is their next storm. Let me give you an example. Last year, right at this time, my brother's brother passed away. 
And he didn't know this, and, and, and he's probably going to beat me at the gym tomorrow. But what he doesn't know is me watching him go through that prepared me for a month and three days, or a month and two days later when my sister passed away. Because I watched him go through it with integrity. I watched him go through it. Yes, he cried. Yes, but he, you know what? The family here surrounded him. So when I went through the same situation almost, when I watched my older sister pass, I was able to go, you know what? I just watched my, and, and listen, this is one of the things that bonded us together as brothers because we, we have this thing in common where we, he walked through it and I watched him walk through it and I'm like, man, I'm not sure I could do that the way, because it wasn't, I think it was two weeks later, he was back on stage. He was up here worshiping God. And I remember thinking, man, that dude is something else. And then when my sister passed, I'm like, whoa, that dude showed me how to be something else. Because when he walked through his storm, I need y'all to get, when you walk through your storm, somebody else is going, hmm, how are they going to handle this one? Maybe they don't even realize they're doing it. Because I didn't even know why, you know, that impressed me. I didn't even know why that touched me. Because I didn't even know Ronnie like that. I had only been here for a month. I had started in August, the beginning of August, and, and here I am, November, and, and this happens, and I'm like, whoa, that dude is something else. Well, then I faced the same thing, and I'm like, I didn't even know I was watching him for that. Didn't even know that I needed that strength to walk through my storm. Somebody's going to get a hold of this, because you're the way your character, your integrity, the way you respond to a storm can affect the way somebody else is able to face their storm. I mean, how awesome is that that God says, you know what, listen, I'm going to chip this thing off of you in your storm. I'm, I'm going to use this to, to perfect you, bring you a little closer to me. But I'm also going to use your storm to affect the way somebody else is walking their life. Because when they look at you and they go, whoa, that person should be, listen, I don't know how many people have gone, uh, you should be dead by now. Yeah, I should be. Yeah, I should be. I shouldn't still be up here. I shouldn't be doing this. Listen, after what I, I walked, and I'm not going to go into a long story with this, but after what I walked through a couple years back, and I shouldn't ever want to stand behind a pulpit again. I shouldn't ever want to pastor people again because I walked through some stuff. But you know what? God used that storm to chip some stuff off me. God used that storm to show me what I needed and what I was missing in my life. It showed me that I, listen, it showed me, what, what I walked through showed me that I couldn't do this alone. That I couldn't be a one-man marching band. It doesn't work. It sounds really off. So, let me show you this. First, Jesus, there's two things here. First off, Jesus went into the storm with them. Jesus will always be in your storm. He's always going to be in your storm. Second thing is there was zero doubt that Jesus was there with them, right? There's zero doubt. They see him. I see you, Jesus, and you're asleep. Why are you asleep in my storm, Jesus? This is my storm. Don't you know how bad this is for me, Jesus? They see Jesus in the boat with them, and they still freaked out. Like, they're still freaking out. Because Jesus is right there. How many of us do that, though? We know Jesus is right there with us. But when the storm hits, we're like, oh, oh no. How do I do this? We, we, we start, like, panicking, hyperventilating because we don't know how we're going to handle it. And I'm not picking on anyone who has anxiety. Trust me. There are moments in life where you become anxious. The question is, is how do you deal with that anxiety? Do you deal with it by freaking out? Or do you deal with it by going, God, you got this? Because see, sometimes Jesus just wants to calm the storm in our life, right? And my other one, my absolute, and this is probably my, my favorite story um, when it comes to the disciples. Uh, yeah, anybody else, ever, like you look at the disciples, you figure out who you identify with. I identify with Peter. One, he used words like reckon and yonder. And I don't know if he used yonder, but I imagine he did. And he liked to fish. I'm like, he's from Middleburg, okay? So I, I identify with Peter because Peter was strong-headed. You know, when, when, when uh, they went to the tomb where Jesus was, right, the disciple whom Jesus loved, which he self-proclaimed that, stops at the door. What did Peter do? He ran all the way in. Peter was that kind of guy. He was all the way in. 
Like when he denied Christ, it wasn't a little bit. He wasn't like, well, you know, maybe I know him. He was, he was like, heck no, I don't know him. He was all in, man. He was like 100% every time, right? Not all the disciples were, but, but Peter was. Peter was kind of crazy, in my opinion, right? In Matthew chapter 14, I'm sorry, is that right? Yeah. It says this, it says, starting in verse 22, it says, Immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side. While he dismissed the crowds, after he, uh, I'm sorry, while he dismissed the crowds, after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening had come along, he was there alone. But the boat by this time was a long way from land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, came to the, he came to them walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It's a ghost! They cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, Take heart, do not be afraid. Then Peter, somebody say Peter's crazy. Peter's crazy! Peter goes... Oh, yeah? Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Be careful what you ask God to let you do. Because he might say yes. And you might, after you step out, go, oh, boy, what was I thinking? I don't know how many people I've talked to in ministry, not in ministry, in Christianity, that, 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 that they're like, what was that? Why did I say Yes. I, listen, if you talk to anybody that's been ministering for a long period of time, I'm sure at some point in their ministry career, they have thought, why did I say yes? I think Pastor spoke about the Matrix the other day, and he's like, why didn't I take the other pill, man? I haven't got a chance to go watch that yet, but I, I'm, I'm going to. I'm off the next two days, so I'm going to make up some lost time. So he said to Peter, come! So Peter got out of the boat and walked on water and came to Jesus. But... When he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to seek and cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus saying to him, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly, you are the son of God. They, I guess they hadn't figured this out time and time again. He's the son of God. But sometimes when we're in the midst of our storm, God asks us to step out. Let me give you some examples. Sometimes when you're, I, I remember I, I, on my first mission trip, right? I went to Peru. I spent 13 days in Peru. I come back from Peru, and I got sick as a dog. Like, I mean, I don't remember ever having the flu like I did when I came back from Peru. It was horrible. So I'm, in, I'm going through this thing, and my pastor calls me. He goes, hey, I need you to preach Sunday. And, and I'm like, I can barely speak. I'm coughing up, you know. I won't give you too much of an example. But it was gross, man. And I felt like garbage. I was running a fever. And it was bad. And, and, and he said, I need you to preach Sunday. I got something. Something came up. I need you to preach. And uh, I said, okay. So I open my Bible and I start to pray. I'm like, God, what do you want me to preach on? Sometimes, you know, when you're studying for a word, it comes real quick. Sometimes you got to pray a little bit. Sometimes you got to study a little bit, and something jumps out at you. Immediately when I open my Bible, God said, I want you to preach on healing. I laughed so hard. I'm like, are you kidding me? I am sick, and this is like Friday. And I'm like, there's no way I'm going to feel better by Sunday. My faith was in action, as you can tell. I was all about it. I'm like, yes, I won't be feeling better by Sunday. There's no way, right? And I, I'm, I'm dying here. I'm like, are you kidding me, God? Healing? Sometimes God asks you to step out of where you were at in the middle of your storm so that he can show something really phenomenal. So I go, and I'm, I, I, I open my Bible. I preach about the man at the gate called Beautiful in Acts chapter 3. I, I'm like, I'm, uh, I'm preaching, and I'm like, trying not to hack up a lung on the pulpit, right? I mean, it's gross. And it's funny because when you're, when you're under the anointing and you've been sick, sometimes it's like it just disappears suddenly, right? And so I'm, I'm, I'm preaching on healing, and there was this older gentleman at our church, and he had skin cancer all down the side of his face. I'm preaching on healing, right? And I give the altar, receive the altar time, 
And this man comes up and I, I lay hands on him and I'm knowing that I'm probably gonna get these people sick because I'm contagious, because I'm running a fever before I got up on the stage, right? And all of a sudden, cancer falls off the guy's face onto the pulpit. Boom, I'm like, I, I was so shocked. I mean, I had faith that it was gonna happen, but I didn't. You ever been there? Like, you're like, I know you can do this, God, you probably won't. I know you can do this. Which, I don't know if you're going to, but I know you can. Right? So I'm praying, and I'm like, I lay hands, and all of a sudden, boom. I'm like, like, I don't know if anybody has ever had a moment where God shocked you right in the middle of being obedient. Right? And, and, and so sometimes when you're broke, God will ask you to give money. Like, I don't know how many times I've been like, like, the, uh, being, and I'm like, really? Where? How? You're in the middle of your storm. God wants you to step out. You're in the middle of your storm. God wants you. He trusts you enough to have faith that he's going to meet you when you step out of that boat. Did you, I, he trusts you enough that you're going to have faith when he says step. And when God called me to ministry, I was like, buh, 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 buh. I felt like Moses, man. I'm like, but I get sick when I speak in front of people. Listen, when I was in school and I had to give an oral report, I was the guy in the trash can chunking up because I literally got physically ill. So when God called me to preach, I, again, I, I've laughed at God many times over the years because I'm just like, the things he asked me to do, I'm just like, why? You know me, don't you? I mean, you see, like, you see how this is going to go, right? First time I ever preached, I gave a seven-minute sermon. Some of you are like, I wish that was tonight. But we get to a place where we're in the middle of our storm and God says, I want you to do this. When, when Peter said, I, I, want, I want to come to you, Jesus, Jesus didn't say, well, why don't you hold out and hang on the boat, I'll come to you. Jesus said, okay, cool, come on. But what we see is we see a reprimand. The reprimand was not telling him that he was lousy, for his lack of faith. The reprimand was to perfect him, to grow him, to shift his mindset to know the next time that he goes to walk on water to Jesus that he could do it. That was the, the correction there. But what we see here is we, we see Peter step out of the boat, and I don't know how many times I've heard a preacher over the year about Jesus, but Peter, he doubted. And we, we see people get on to Peter, but guess what? There were 11 other jokers in the boat that didn't even step out. There were 11 other jokers in the boat that didn't have the, the, the faith to go, you know what, can you call me out there? After Peter, listen, most of us, when we see somebody else do something in faith, we're like, yes, I can do that because they did that. I can do that. It, it builds our faith, right? When we see somebody else walk through their storm and come out the other side smelling like roses, we're like, yes, that is awesome. And the next time the storm comes up, we got one of two responses. We're either like, yes, we got this, Jesus. Or we're like, another storm. Sometimes we get weary. Sometimes we get worn out. And those are the moments where we really have to say, Jesus, I know you're in the boat with me, and I know you can calm this storm. But if you choose to let me go through this storm and not calm this storm, allow me to walk on the wall. Somebody got to get a hold of that because you're either in a storm or you're about to go through a storm and you need that kind of faith. You either need to have the faith that Jesus is going to silence the storm or he's going to call you to walk on the water in the storm. How awesome is that? Waves are all over the place, right? Peter goes, oh yeah? I, and I, 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 I just imagine it like this. I don't know, if it, does anybody else ever do this when you're reading the Bible? Like you imagine what it would actually look like? I imagine Peter standing on the bow. And Jesus walking towards him, I imagine he was probably from here to the, pool, the, the, the sound booth away when they saw him. They're like, anybody else see that? There's a ghost. And Jesus is like, no, 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 it's just me, guys. I'm paraphrasing here. He says, it's just me, guys. Don't worry about it. I, I'm, I'm coming out to save you. And Peter is my favorite because Peter goes, oh, really? Are you sure it's you, Jesus? If it's you, let me come out there with you. Because Jesus is walking on water. I mean, I don't know about y'all, but if I were Peter, and I'm standing there, and I'm seeing Jesus walk on water, I'm like, I want to do that. Like anybody else, like you see something like cool happening, you're like, I want to do that. Right? And Peter's like, like, if that's really you, 
prove it to me. How many of us do that to God? Prove it, God. Prove it. I'm going to share a secret in case y'all don't know. God don't have to prove nothing to us. But in that moment, Jesus goes, Hey, Peter. Come on, buddy. Come on, let's do this thing. Let's, let's just take a stroll on the water. And Peter steps out. And at first, it doesn't say how far he walked. I assume it was more than a step. I assume it was more than he stepped out and stood there because it says, and he walked on water. And he walked on water. And he walked on water. So he steps out and he walks on water and then he sees the storm. So somewhere in his head, he's thinking, oh my gosh, this is so awesome. And then he goes, oh my gosh, there's a storm. How many of us do that? We step out in faith. God, listen, and I'm going to wrap it up with this. So if, if the band wants to make their way back up, I'm going to wrap it up with this. Either your storm's going to be caused when you get through what you're supposed to get through, whether it be the protection, the perfecting, or the correcting, or God's going to call you to step out on the water. See, too many times we're, we're like, well, maybe, maybe not. See, God's spoken to some of you about things that he wants to do in your life. Maybe, maybe some of you, you've heard you need to go get a passport and you're, you're hesitating. Maybe some of you, you're supposed to step out in a business venture and you're hesitating. Maybe some of you are supposed to step out in a new ministry venture and you're hesitating. Maybe fill in your blank. Fill in your blank. Maybe you're supposed Maybe you're supposed to do whatever that next thing is. Maybe God's calling you to step out in faith. And you're like, it's 2020, God. Have you seen what's going on? Yeah. Guess what? He was not surprised when 2020 hit. He wasn't surprised when COVID came around. He wasn't surprised when the election turned out the way it's... He wasn't surprised when... Whatever the thing is that's going on, whatever your storm is, it, it, it does not surprise him at all. He's not sitting up there waiting for something to happen in your life and go, oh my gosh, Debbie, I didn't see that coming. I'm so sorry. No. He's like, Debbie, I saw it coming. How are you going to respond? How are you going to come through your storm? How are you going to walk through this thing that seems like all hell is broken lo loose in your life? pastor talks a lot of times about the T's. Anybody know what the T's is in here? Time, my treasure, testimony, right? You cannot share a testimony that you do not have. I'll say that again. You cannot share a testimony. You, do, you might be able to share somebody else's testimony, but then you're just regurgitating somebody else's experience. There's something to be said about when you say, this is what happened when I walked through this. There's something to be said about when somebody watches you walk through hell and you go, you know what? I'm not giving up. I'm not backing out because I know Jesus is in my boat. So I pray that Jesus is in your boat tonight. And if he's not, guess what? Tonight's a prime opportunity for you to get Jesus in your boat. How do you do that? You believe with your heart, you confess with your mouth that Jesus is the Son of God and that God raised him from the dead. You believe on him. You believe on him. Maybe tonight you're walking through something and, and you're tired of walking alone, man. I don't know if I'm talking to somebody or if I'm just speaking to the air tonight, but you're walking through. Maybe you're online. If you're online, you know, just type in the chat there. I'm going through it. Maybe you're walking through something and you're like, oh, man. I don't know if I can keep going. Maybe you're walking through something, you're like, I just want to hunker down in the bow of my boat and not do anything. Well, tonight, God wants to move from where you are to where he wants you. Tonight, God wants to operate and show you and, and guide you and teach you in the storm you're in. Or he's going to prepare you for the storm that's coming. Listen, we live in Florida. We know about storm preparation. If you don't, you haven't lived in Florida very long. You can be prepared for the storms spiritually that come into your life. How do you do that? <laughs> you walk with God. You learn as much as you can. 
come to Bible study, you come to Sunday morning service, you come to Wednesday night church, you get involved wherever there's an opportunity for you to be in fellowship with other believers that might be walking through something. Because you never know what your testimony is going to break free in somebody else's life. How awesome is that? The disciples said, we rejoice because we count, we were counted worthy to walk through this. How many of us can say the same thing? Most of us can. So after tonight, I want you to be in a place where you say, you know what? Young people, I want you to be in a place. If you want to put your phones down for just a minute, I want you to be in a place where you say, I'm ready for the next storm. I'm ready for whatever comes my way. Where you can say that whatever you're walking through is going to affect somebody else's life. And I pray that not just the young people hear that tonight. So the worship team's going to lead us in a, a, another worship song and we're going to have altar workers down here to either side of the stage. If you need prayer, I, I encourage you. Come down. Let us pray for you. Let us walk. Listen, the beautiful thing about Christianity is we don't have to do this walk alone. Let us join hands with you in faith and pray you through whatever you're walking through. Let us walk with you through it. So with that, let's stand to our feet. Father, we just thank you for tonight, God. We thank you that, Lord, you reign, God that you are with us in our storms, that you prepare us for our storms, and you give us peace through our storms, God. That you never leave us, you never forsake us, but God, you hold us up when the wind seems at its hardest, when the rain seems like it's crashing down, when the, the, the tornado seems to be just whipping us around, God, that you have us. And Lord, tonight we praise you, we honor you in Jesus' name. Amen.